put it in Trinidad and Tobago's history. Gang warfare, according to some, is raging in the capital city. On New Year's Eve, 10 persons alone were shot in an incident on Charlotte Street while they all did their shopping. Last week, gunmen alighted from a car and opened fire members, on members of a rival gang. Murders continue to rise every single day, and there's a level of fear that seems to not be dissipating among the citizenry. The Prime Minister has said that it's a small number of people who are committing these crimes and holding the country to ransom. So why is it so difficult to get a handle on this? Well, joining us this morning for the first time uh, for an extended interview, one-on-one, -on -one, we have the Minister of National Security, Minister Stuart Young. Minister, good morning. Thank you for Hi, joining good us. Good morning, Hima. Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you for having me. Now, obviously, since last Thursday, we're going to get straight into the big story of the day. Since last Thursday, there's been a lot of developments uh, back and forth coming out of comments that you made at the post-Cabinet news briefing. Just for the benefit, we're going to take in a couple seconds of what you told the public through this briefing and then get into the meat of the issue. This is what Minister Young had to say at that post-cabinet news briefing speaking about the spiraling crime situation in this country. Who is it that stands to derive the most benefit from sudden spikes in the murder rate and from the narrative of a murder rate has gone in an upward direction and has broken records and these types of things? He stopped short of identifying a person or an organization, but National Security Minister Stuart Young says the police are investigating certain people who are empowering criminals to instill fear into citizens and create instability. That there are certain people in our society who want to create the impression and create a sense of fear and to create a sense of panic in Trinidad and Tobago about what they call the runaway rate of crime. At Thursday's post-cabinet news conference, Minister Young hesitated to provide further details, including whether there was a political link, only saying the police would inform the population once investigations are completed. At the appropriate time, I am certain that the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service will inform the public of Trinidad and Tobago as to what it is happening there and who it is in our society that is actively pursuing communications with the criminal elements to push crime in a certain way. Minister Young, you are here this morning. Obviously, that information prompted and sparked not just conversations in the media, online and among the citizenry. What prompted you to reveal this information? Hema, you could stand testimony, and as one of my witnesses, that when I came in as the Minister of National Security in August 2018, I stated at that time I was not going to be a Minister of National Security who engaged in a lot of talk and a lot of conversation, what I call a lot of rah-rah, and um, engaging the media and the public all of the time. But I would be very, very cautious, and I'd intervene at the appropriate times. With national security, it is always balancing. You're balancing the protection of national security, the protection of investigations, but the public have a right to know. What we've seen, as you sa said at the outset of this interview, is we've seen a murder rate that has been climbing. But at the same time, I know from where I sit that the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service or Defense Force or prisons or immigration our fire services, our intelligence services are working overtime and they're working together for the first time in a very long time and sharing information. In fact, when you look at it last year, you actually saw for the first six months of last year, the murder rate and the, even after August 2018, the murder rate with the coming in of the new commissioner of police going a downward, a, a downward way. I have also not engaged statistics at all, because I don't think that's my job as Minister of National Security. My job is really to rally the forces, make sure they're properly resourced. But what we saw towards the end of last year, in the second half of last year, and particularly in the last quarter of last year, is some very strange happenings. At last week's post-cabinet press conference, three things. I am always very careful in my choice of words and how far I go in light of what I've just said as my precy. Two, I did not call a single name, nor point a finger in a single direction. I just said that we are certain that there are persons who stand to benefit and there are persons who may be communicating with criminals. And three, I also cautioned people that all was not what it seemed. 
and provided information that, listen, when you have things like that going on, you don't just sit back. And certainly we are not just sitting back and allowing things to be done in a vikey way. We're using intelligence and we're putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And I thought it's important that the public be told that, listen, all is not what it seems. And I would not have said that if I had not been provided with the information by our Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. So I'm putting this clearly on the record because people seem to be missing this point. I saw some commentators suggesting, take it to the police if you have information. That's completely not applicable in these circumstances. It is the police that gave the information to me as the Minister of National Security. And I'll repeat it again. You are provided, whoever sits in the chair, you're provided with constant briefs, constant reports from the police, from the defense force, from your intelligence services. In this instance, it is the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service that brought the information to me, as well as our intelligence services. Did Cabinet know that you were going to reveal this information No, at Cabinet that time? did not know. I am very, very cautious with the protection of information for a, f a number of reasons, including the protection of ongoing police investigations. And I was very careful. I didn't give any specifics. Both editorials accused you yesterday of basically crying wolf. You said that you got the information from the police service. In essence, they said that it was scoring cheap political points. Uh, there was a distinction made between evidence and information. So let's start. You were a successful lawyer before entering the world of politics. So what were you hoping to achieve by doing this? As I just said, what you have to do is a constant balancing exercise. The public have a right to be provided with information. One of the things I found ironic in, in, in those editorials yesterday, and I have no problem about criti criticism. That comes with the territory. I am not immune to criticism, and I don't have a problem with criticism. But for example, one of the newspapers ran this story about stop the gun talk, uh, editorial, sorry. But then buried on page eight, your lead investigative reporter, Mark Bassant, runs a story collaborating and confirming what I have said and going into much more detail. In fact, I was shocked to see how much detail he had when he set out that he said, I think intelligence sources provided him with information and then he quoted the commissioner of police confirming exactly what I had said, that they had uncovered a plot of someone who wanted to spike the murder rate towards the end of last year. So I found that a little contradictory. And also with the other editorial, as I say, I understand people, and, and in particular the media have a role to play. I have no problem with that. In fact, I encourage and protect freedom of the press. But one of the things in the next editorial, in the, in the uh, Express editorial that I found a little ironic, is you're saying that the minister, you have concern about the minister being involved in investigations. I am not involved in any police They're investigations. They're basically saying that you're using information that Correct. you've gotten as Minister of National Security Correct. to make statements and make cast aspersions on the opposition in particular. As I say, I didn't call any name at all. And it was very, very timely and very noteworthy who decided to rush out and who decided to engage it when no fingers were pointed on my part. But as I say, the persons in Trinidad and Tobago, the public in Trinidad and Tobago, and the wider public outside of Trinidad and Tobago, need to know, you see it happen all the time, they need to know what is going on, but within cautionary lines. And that is exactly what I did. So again, you can't say that the minister must be accountable and the minister of national security is the one who everything, the buck stops with. But if the minister has certain information that the population should know that, listen, we are working over time, we have made inroads, you have been seeing certain decreases in other areas of crime. But all it takes is one person, again with an automatic, or three people with automatic weapons, to go and shoot innocent people. Obviously, that is something we have to look at. Obviously, the public would want to know well, what really is going on there. If this is not gang versus gang, what could that possibly be? So you, you mentioned the word information. Is there information, or do you have evidence that there is a plot by persons to destabilize this country? I don't, as you said rightly a short while ago, information and evidence are two separate things. The police are the ones who gather evidence. Intelligence services gather information and intelligence that then must be converted to evidence for charges to be laid and prosecution to be, to be um, pursued. As I've said, and I'll say it clearly here again, the police service are pursuing investigations to convert information into evidence. Do you think it was a little uh, presumptuous or a little reckless on your part to release this information in the public domain, which was also stated as a concern that you may have won 
possibly hinder these investigations or forewarn those who are guilty, as you say, of destabilizing or attempting to destabilize the country? The answer is no. I, obviously, I wouldn't think I was reckless or, or I stepped out of line. And also, I was very cautious. No names called, no fingers pointed. And it's not going to jeopardize ongoing investigations. And by the way, to say that as well is, is not really understanding it. Because, of course, this is historical. So I can't change the past. I can't change what persons have already done, what actions they've already pursued, what communication certain people have had with other people. That has already happened. So me coming after the fact to say there's a concern about this in no way hinders the ongoing investigation. You look at, so you talk about this information and they're hoping to translate it into evidence. How long, again, before this information is taken as evidence and charges are laid? Again, that is something that I have found that in law enforcement in particular, it takes some time. For example, the anti-gang legislation. The anti-gang legislation, we fought hard for it. The public, there was a public outcry, and that is why the parliamentarians agreed to the anti-gang legislation. I can say, and I'll put it on record here with you this morning, Hima, it is being utilized actively every single week when I meet with the heads of the various arms of national security. It is one of the areas we discuss. There have been a number of charges a number of significant people. People who I would call big fish have been charged using the anti-gang legislation. But these things take time. It takes time to build out a successful case because you have various ways of getting evidence. Via technology, then you also have what we call human intelligence, persons who will give testimony. And of course, people are a little more cautious in that area. Now, you must appreciate, Minister Young, that this is the fourth year, going into the fifth year of the PNM Correct. administration. We've heard statements even from you on the political platform about corruption and wrongdoing. So when you come out and you see that there is information to suggest this, people are, their patience has completely run out and they are a little cautious about believing politicians because they're going to say, we've not seen the slew of arrests, we've not seen these people. And is it simply yet another crying wolf in the public domain? I understand public cynicism. It is very, very understandable, the level of cynicism that public has, especially towards politicians, I, I completely appreciate it. But one thing I have always been very, two things, you know, since becoming involved in politics, I've always been particularly cautious about. One, I don't make promises. I'm never going to be called that person who makes promises and breaks promises. And two, I'm always very cautious in the words that I utter, and I am never once put forward any false information, misleading information, or information to send people down a rabbit hole into the public domain. Every single statement that I make, even before being Minister of National Security, for example, when I was speaking about anti-corruption matters at the time I was driving, always I have the documentary um, evidence, evidence on those occasions, or the information to support what I've said. And do you accept the criticism that that information was information given to you in your capacity as a national security minister and putting it out in the public domain is simply to tarnish those who oppose you, to make an excuse and to cop out to say this is why crime, why we can't handle crime? Absolutely not. I don't for a moment have to have an excuse as to why crime is existing and what is going on with respect to crime. At the end of the day, I am not responsible for crime. I am trying to be a part of the solution for crime and working with all of those who are interested in finding solutions for crime. There is absolutely nothing I have done to facilitate crime or to, to help criminals in their activities. In fact, my mantra is no one is above the law. So and it to wasn't answer an the excuse first part, that Sorry, to answer off. the first part, yes, I got the information as the Minister of National Security, and that is why people need to take note that as the Minister of National Security, as I said a short while ago, you are provided with even coming here, driving in the car, being brought here to the studio this morning. I was being provided with certain reports and certain information as to the ongoing environment in Trinidad and Tobago. Have you given the Commission a timeline to say we need to act on this now? Because the population is looking to you, Minister Young, to say, okay, you've said this. This is a very serious allegation. It could be even citing trees on you, attempting to destabilize a country through manipulating the crime statistics. That, If you have information, then how soon do you expect an arrest? So I have the information. I said the police service provided that information for me. The police service have assured me that they're actively investigating it. The Commissioner of Police and myself will be meeting shortly. And then this is, this is one of the items that I have been discussing with him. But again, I must be very cautious 
not to cross that line of interference, and I'm always very cautious. So I don't ever, ever demand that this is what the police must do, etc. I would say I am hoping that you all are pursuing these investigations, putting sufficient resources. If there are any other resources that you need, please let me know, let me see how we could get it, and these types of things. Now, Minister, after this revelation, uh, Dr. Rudal Munila released a voice note, uh, and there was also an article in the Express newspaper, it was yesterday as well, uh, looking at a joint select commi committee, and I see that the opposition uh, came out, but Dr. Rudal Munila in particular had this to say to Minister Young. Making such a far-reaching statement without any evidence is proof that the Minister of National Security is attacking all political and civic organizations such as the business chamber, political parties, trade unions, NGOs, and religious organizations. Stuart Young is now the Minister of Insecurity. The Minister is trying to create an atmosphere where everyone is a suspect and people feel as if they can't trust anyone. Stuart Young is trying to create insecurity and fear in the hearts and minds of our citizens. I have called upon the Chairman of the Joint Select Committee on National Security, Mr. Fitzgerald Hines, to convene an emergency meeting of the JSC on security so that Minister Young can come before a parliamentary team and explain himself, uh, explain the nature of his allegations and accusations, explain whether in camera or not the conspiracy theories that he is now propagating, and um, explain himself to the full uh, capacity that he can so that the country can understand what he's about. As it is now, he appears clueless and hapless, and I share the views of the major newspapers of this day that if he cannot bring change to the calamity and crisis facing this nation, he ought to do the writing and resign. The incoming government of Kamla Prasad Bisesa has already outlined a major uh, crime plan. It was outlined in the comprehensive budget statement of the opposition leader last September. Uh, that involves greater use of the defense force, legislative change. And excerpt they're giving you a kind of what Dr. Rudal Munilal and the opposition are saying. We take a short break and when we come back, Minister Young will respond to that. Yesterday he released a statement to the media. We're going to find out how this JSC request is going to pan out. Stay with us. This is... Welcome back, Trinidad and Tobago. We are continuing our conversation with Minister Stuart Young. This is the first time that Minister Young is doing an extended one-on-one -on -one interview about the crime situation in the country. All eyes are on him, and to many, he's in a hot seat. Uh, the country and the government is basically judged on the ability to control crime, the level and the quality of life of, Trin of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Minister, on this issue of evidence, information, and according to Dr. Munila, conspiracy theories, the call to go to the Joint Select Committee. Emma, let me start by saying that the opposition have a job to do. Also to remind the population, as I've seen widely circulated within the last few days, when the opposition, the UNC, became the opposition in this country, they were very clear and they said that they were going to disrupt, that they were going to make the place ungovernable, etc. The opposition have the right to request whatever it is they want be sent to a joint select committee. I am very, very clear in what I am doing, in what I have said, and as I have officially said now and put out a statement last night, I am more than prepared to go before any joint select committee in Trinidad and Tobago's parliament and provide whatever information I have in my possession that I'm permitted to provide and to assist the joint select committee. So I am not afraid of that whatsoever. Nothing that I have said is unsubst um, unsubstantiated. So I am not at all concerned about that. Dr. Munilal has a role to play. Dr. Munilal is a person who has a lot of questions to answer. He's a person who is actually before the courts with allegations of cartel behavior and corruption. I remind the population of that. The evidence against Dr. Munilal in that civil case was a slew of text messages between himself and contractors and checks and this type of thing. So I understand he might be a person who People react to nervousness in different ways. Certain people, when they get nervous, feel they have to jump out front and scream and shout. He's a senior maybe, member of the maybe, opposition, correct. so it is his right to, do, and, to and respond no, and to I the government. And I have absolutely no problem with him responding. And we know that people are innocent until proven guilty, just like evidence and information. Correct. But at the same time, the same way Dr. Munilal is permitted to go out there and say what he wants, very, very often getting himself in trouble, I am just responding to that. So one, I have no problem with the call for a joint select committee. I am prepared to go before a joint select committee and to provide the information to the joint select committee. 
would you be requesting the chairman of the of the Joint Select Committee on National Security convene this national security? This is Fitzgerald Hines, I believe it is. Will you be officially making this request to let's let's convene this Joint Select Committee? I have no request to make of the the Joint Select Committee. I am a humble servant of the Parliament. I'm an elected member of Parliament. I'm a Minister of Government at the Prime Minister's purview. So whatever the Joint Select Committee wants, the same way for the first time in the history of Trinidad and Tobago, we had a Prime Minister who went before a Joint Select Committee to deal with matters and corruption associated with the port when he was requested. I find myself in a similar position. If a request is made of me, I will present myself. It is for the Joint Select Committee de de to determine the type of forum they want, if they want it in camera, if they want it out of camera. I was going Matters to of national security are uh, areas that you must be very, very cautious about. I am, however, going to say what needs to be said with the, the supporting information at that Joint Select Committee. So I have no fear and I have no issues with it whatsoever. If you look at it, then those who are critical of your statements and critical of your government will say Fitzgerald Hines will not convene a Joint Select Committee, that they will hide you or protect you in this matter. Absolutely not. I don't need any hiding and I don't, I don't need to hide and I certainly don't need to be protected. You mentioned and you went to painstaking lengths because you also released a statement to say that you didn't call names. You questioned about who stands to gain by destabilizing this country and by a rising crime rate. Is the opposition fueling crime in this country? At the end of the day, that is for the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service to come out and say, I am not getting into that realm at all. What I can say is those who are fueling crime in this country are criminals. Anyone who is pursuing crime and pushing the criminality in this country are criminals. And there are people at various levels in society. I heard Dr. Munilal try to pull a whole set of people. I am not attacking the chambers of commerce. Well, I was going to ask, is the business community unions. also fueling crime? I am not attacking any of those persons. At the end of the day, the body, the only body charged with the responsibility constitutionally of po prosecuting crime and criminality, finding the evidence and taking it to the DPP is the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. As the Minister of National Security, you are the line minister for them. They report to you, they provide you with information, and that is the that is the rule of one of the rules of the Minister of National Security. You look at this and you say, so I ask if the opposition or the business community, you said you're not going to get into the specifics of this. So the, it's a police. So we're now seeing the distinction between your rule and the police. You have passed a slew of legislation your government has spearheaded, which gives the police a breathing room. So if the statement was made, then why not go round up everybody that you think is guilty or behind the spike in the murder rate? Well, at the end of the day, that's a question directed to the police, but the police, I always tell them, I am their number one advocate, I am their number one bulletproof vest. I tell the police this every single week when I meet with them, once they act within the parameters of the law. So the police are very aware, sometimes they're overly cautious in my view, but it is better to be safe than sorry, and the police are aware that they need to build the case, they need to have the evidence, so you could have information. But until you have the evidence to support it in a court of law, then they can't take that action. And I know they're working closely with the Director of Public Prosecutions Are as you well. giving the police the support that they need to do their jobs? Because if you're making the distinction, <coughs> say, I can't go out and arrest, and I've heard that from the Prime Minister, then are you giving the police the resources they need to do their job? Absolutely. I mean, the Commissioner of Police is on record in that same Joint Select Committee of Parliament of National Security as saying that he has the resources we are in economic times where everybody can't get all that they want, but certainly the police is one area that we have been, been providing a lot of resources to, and will continue to do so. Minister, about this, because you know a lot of the interview will be linked to Thursday's post-cabinet news briefing. These are serious allegations to make. It is also rumored that politicians have links to gang members, that, po that politicians use muscle on the ground during election times. And this has been a criticism that has been leveled not only against the PNM, but the UNC as well. Have you heard these rumors, and are you investigating politicians for links to gangsters? Again, I am not part of the investigative arm of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service or even in Trinidad and Tobago. I would love to be, I would love to come back in another life as a special prosecutor and use my legal skills to prosecute and to pursue special prosecutions. Yes, we've all heard those rumors. I think there's more than rumors out there. I believe that the police should pursue any such conversations. I mean, even this weekend, people were providing me with information, information of those types of links, etc. 
and uh, I think they need to be pursued by the police service. I think this is a very, very dangerous, and I'm not suggesting that it has only come up in the last five years or in the last 10 years. We, every time this topic of conversation comes up, you always hear persons talk about what has gone on for many, many years. But you are it against see, members of your own party as well, Minister. Well, and I did not draw a distinction. I said we have heard this, and I said not only in this five years, also in the previous and before that. What I can say without fear of contradiction is I, Stuart Young, have never, ever engaged in that type of behavior. In fact, I've had it happen in my constituency where persons who are persons of interest, as the police call it, have asked to meet and stuff, and I've refused because I personally am not going to engage in that type of behavior. Are there persons who are engaging in it? Yes. Have I been provided with information by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service with respect to that type of behavior? Yes. Is it against members of the current government, against the opposition, and who's being investigated? It is, it is against certain members of parliament, and again, I will leave it at that because I don't want to interfere with any police investigation. Why are there so many guns on our streets? You know, I hear you mentioned earlier when people have high-powered um, high Power. rifles and you have these assault rifles, you see the level of devastation that they cause. Why are there so many guns in our country, Minister Young? I think that's a good question. I mean, over 80% of the murders that have carried out are through the use of guns. The vast majority, 99%, through illegal firearms. That has been a bugbear of the society for quite a while. It is something that we're working assiduously on. Obviously, we don't make any guns in Trinidad and Tobago, so they've come in via illegal ports of entry, but also via legal ports of entry. As I've said consistently, the AR-15s and the Glock handguns, the AR-15s are the assault weapons, and Glock handguns are from the United States and from North America. They're not from South America. So we are pursuing now, and just over the last few weeks, we've been I've been pushing it even further along that we need to have multi-agency task force to deal with our legal ports of entry. So you talk about the illegal and legal. How difficult is it to get the scanners working every single day of the week? You are Minister of National Security. If you say that there are guns, because people can accept, okay, the Coast Guard can't be everywhere. I think maybe they'll accept that to an extent. But if you say that guns are entering legally, then what is the issue? First of all, the scanners don't fall under the Minister of National Security. Well, should the they scanners, The scanners fall under the Customs and Excise Department. As far as I am aware, the scanners are working. So if they're working so and guns well, are coming in... Scanners are working. Not every container, is my understanding, is scanned. Yes, in true. fact, this is one of the areas that we're looking at. So what we're doing is we're pushing, and I'm, what I'm, I've actually gotten the training from one of the UNDP's arms, something called C Corp and Air Corp, where they are actually now coming in to train our multi-agencies, because I don't want to leave that task alone to customs. Everything in the fight against crime works better when you have the various agencies working together, bringing their different strengths to the table, and that's how we're going to deal with that. I've also sought the assistance of the United States. In fact, up to yesterday, I was engaging in communication with some of the arms of the United States whole apparatus of national security telling him, listen, we've asked for the assistance, this is what I want to do. I also want to go after the narcotics and illegal firearms coming into Trinidad and Tobago. I've had a lot of conversation with them over the past week with respect to that. I'm telling them, look, I need to action it now. I want to implement it because no one's above the law. We are going after the illegal firearms. The problem is that too many of them came in at a period of time when, you know, I, I listen all the time and I smile where I hear the cry of the borders are too porous, etc. All islands have porous borders. Right. Even in the United Kingdom, in, even in the United States on the coastline, you have people entering their borders illegally. In the United States, you have people entering and they have all the money in the world entering their land-based borders consistently. That's a hot topic in the politics of the United States. So we are doing the best that we can. If I wish we had more Coast Guard vessels, our radar system is working. I say for the million time, it is working. So if it is working and because the guns and the people are still coming in. Let me tell you something. I took your colleagues out on a Coast you Guard did. vessel for them to understand what seven miles means. A fast speedboat crossing seven miles does so in a matter of minutes. So if you have a radar system that picks a vessel moving up, you 
you then have to intercept and to get a Coast Guard vessel. We don't have Coast Guard vessels to man every single mile of the water. So it's a time to rethink the, the strategy. No, it's not time. It's time to get the additional resources, which is why we're getting the two Cape class vessels that you can base strategically based on intelligence. Since coming into office, we have studied the intelligence patterns of where these vessels come from, where they're going, and we're trying to cut them off. And we have been doing so. You've been seeing in the media in weeks that they've been intercepting vessels, we've been deporting Venezuelans, and these types of things. Have you traced these guns? You know in Jamaica, which is a <coughs> lot of people cite uh, to talk about a crime rate, they traced in 2008 to 2012 most of the guns on the streets, and they were all linked to Jamaican gangs operating in Broward County out of the U.S. and in Florida. So have you traced these guns to say all of the guns come from here or come from there, or they're linked to these gangs or not? Your data is very interesting, the time of your data, 2008 to 2012. Yeah. If you go now and you look at what is happening, there's a new, f new phenomenon. So the answer is yes, we are working on the tracing along with the, the Americans and, and we have a special unit that does that. It analyzes all of the firearms that we pick up, the illegal ones, and then we send it back to the United States for information. There Why is do a we registry. not have a ballistics <coughs> lab here? Is it a lack of resources? We, we, have, we have a ballistics lab here. We have the ballistics capability here, etc. What has happened is forensics has had a lack of, of resources in that area is just being flooded with too much, but it's not only forensic side, it's an arm of the Trinidad and Tobago Police called Siru, and they have been provided with the training by the United States as well as the, the hardware and software to be able to do what they need to do. What happens is after a specific period of time in the United States, they stop carrying the records of guns. Right. So the older firearms, like when I look at the Glocks that are being found, the older ones, some of them, they're no longer recorded in the United States. But yes, we are doing that exercise. And what has also happened is the criminals have become more sophisticated. So they're also manipulating some of these firearms to make it more difficult to trace, but we are working on it as The firearms that you see in these videos, Minister Young, are firearms used by US military. They're firearms used in war and from Correct. mass destruction. So these are not old firearms, the high-powered firearms. No, 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 absolutely. So the firearms in particular, the AR-15s that I've been talking about time and time again in the parliament, and this is why we brought the legislation, the Bail Amendment Act Number 2 of 2019, to say that once you're found in possession of an automatic firearm, you should have no bail for 120 days. You heard certain people cry, oh, murder, draconian law, etc. Barbados recently passed legislation. If you're found with any illegal firearm, two years, no bail, we're asking for 120 days, and we will bring your case within 120 days. These are the things that are necessary in the fight against crime. You've heard the commissioner of police time and time again say, if you find these individuals, these shooters, who have these types of weapons and are terrorizing our society, you <coughs> arrest them, charge them, put them before the court, and then they're released on bail immediately. They're coming back out and we are finding it many times. The same individuals then going back out and committing crimes with illegal firearms again. So if we Helping know that's happening, fight crime. if we know that is happening, <coughs> then what, is, what, is, what could be done? Would we just say well, that's just a cycle? No, not at all. That's why I'm saying that we brought the bail amendment and we're asking the opposition are the ones who are standing in the way of that. The opposition are saying, including the leader of the opposition, this is too draconian, you can't allow this to happen. But we are saying exactly, you are the one that just said it. These firearms are created for war. One of these firearms, and look at these last two sets of serious shootings in Port of Spain on the 31st of January of last year, 31st of December of last year, as well as last week. When we found the firearms being used, they were these sophisticated assault weapons. Does any member of society, any civic-minded citizen of Trinidad and Tobago want to see these firearms out? Do they think that these people who carry these firearms should be allowed back on the streets? I would be surprised if they do. We take a short break. When we come back, we have a lot more topics to discuss with the Minister of National Security, including calls for a state of emergency. Stay with us. This is The Morning Group. According to the Chamber of Commerce, the crime situation is out of control. Extreme situations call for ex extreme measures. There are calls for a state of emergency, Minister. Why has your government not done it or even listened to the people on this? Absolutely, we listen to the people, but at the end of the day, it is up to the government to make that determination. I don't think the chambers are calling for a state of emergency. I am putting on record once again. 
I am absolutely not in support of a state of emergency at this point in time. As I sit with all of the heads of the various arms of national security, it is very clear that the measures that they need to put in place, they're implementing, that are way before a state of emergency. Do you think in we're fact, not in a crisis now, Minister? Well, I, I don't think we're in a place that we want to be. I don't think that we're in a satisfactory place, but no, we're not in a crisis. A state of emergency is the last door, you know. There's, there's nothing after a state of emergency. So Businessmen complain about the state of emergency, and I saw it being reflected in a recent article that it affected business, because of course, when you have a state of emergency, you've closed for business hours. Let me use the best when example here, Mark. When without the state of emergency, businesses have a higher cost of security. Yeah. Their employees are afraid to come to work. People are dying. They also have to be cognizant that I'm closing at different hours. So whether or not, I mean, one, um, we listen to some commentators saying, currently, we are living in a self-imposed state of emergency. All right, so let me use the best example. People like to scream state of emergency. We have two very recent examples how states of emergency do not work. Right, because after a state of emergency, there's nothing left. First, let's understand what a state of emergency means. It means that I am abandoning your constitutional rights. So as a philo philo philosophical point of view, I don't believe that you ever go that route until you're in an absolute last opposition and we're far from there. In 20, when was it, 2012, 2011, the UNC had a state of emergency. It failed because right afterwards, things go right back to usual. There was not a single successful prosecution coming out of that. Two, right in our region, and I see commentators like Ralph Mirage consistently refer to Jamaica, Jamaica. right, and the special zones legislation. In my humble opinion, and absolutely no disrespect to Jamaica, I'm in very constant communication with Dr. Horace Chang, who's the Minister of National Security in Jamaica. I like the Jamaican government, their, their personnel. I interact with them all the time. It isn't working. When they first their came Their economy out, is thriving. When, Businesses okay, are running to Jamaica. But, but look at it. Their murder rate hasn't come down. Look at all of the zones where they're having the special states of emergency. It is failing. Right now, the opposition is saying, you told us this would be a 90-day measure. We're now in over two years of it. It hasn't worked. I have spoken to the Jamaican businessmen and the ones who are successful. The state of emergency has not eradicated crime because it can't eradicate crime. And now they're not having the types of success they had when they initially had it. It is because it has just become normal. It is the normal business in front. I, I saw one of the Jamaican newspapers yesterday. The headline is, the soldiers are now up in arms about what is going on there because it, is, it has just been too long and is dragging on. So a state of emergency is not the answer. It's a nice catchphrase. There are many other things that we need to do. Let the, and I why am planning are we not to doing meet, it Well, then? we are doing it. I am planning to meet with the chambers of commerce. I also want to meet with the, a lot of persons in society, the private security firms. I'm going to make a call for some of the criminologists to come forward, the UE Guild to come forward. A lot of sectors of society, let us sit down together let me listen to them along with the Commission of Police, the Chief of Defense Staff and others. Let us hear what their propositions are, what their proposals are in tackling crime. We are all in this thing together. It is not only the state alone, but we are the ones who are charged with the responsibility of making it a safer place. And I, I am telling the people of Trinidad and Tobago here today, a state of emergency is not the way to go. A state of emergency, look at how it is utilized in the United States. It is for times of crisis. There's been a snow. So you're a saying we're not in a crisis <clears throat> right now? We are not in a crisis right now, Hema, where you have like a 1990 situation where you've had a massive natural disaster. Do you disaster and your cabinet colleagues walk the streets, Minister, outside your constituency? Do you walk the streets? Do, you, do any of your colleagues walk the streets and find out what the people feel and how f afraid they are? I, I hope that they all do. I'm sure that many of them do. I do it every time I venture out. I have people, if I'm in the grocery, etc., coming up to me con constantly and sharing their views with me and this type of thing. How does a state of emergency solve that? First of all, a state of emergency is not something that goes on forever. So what you do in a state of emergency is for a very limited period in time. So that is, that is not even a plus on a saw, as far as I'm concerned. And as I say, you look at what happened under the UNC period when they called a state of emergency. It failed. Well, it we see failed the soldier and building. And now, and now you have 
tens of millions of dollars being awarded to the same people that they locked up in a state of emergency. Minister, we do have to go straight to the news. When we come back, we're going to find out what the government is doing. The minister's insisting that they are doing, they are doing and they are taking steps. We're going to find out what these steps are. Stay with us. Welcome back, Trinidad and Tobago. We have a couple minutes again with Minister Young. Minister Young is saying that the government is putting mechanisms in place. Minister, you know, the state of emergency, and I asked whether or not you and your cabinet colleagues walk on the streets to find out what people are see feeling, the sense of fear. The chambers have called for some sense of a greater police presence, limited state of emergencies in high risk and at-risk at communities. Why not do that? Well, first of all, that is happening, all right? The what you've seen happening is a lot more work between the agencies. So all of the time you're seeing a lot more support from the Defense Force, and I am going to be pushing them for more support from the Defense Force. You're seeing for the first time in a long time a lot of the agencies consistently working together. The benefits of that from a prosecutorial gathering evidence point take some time. What you saw last year, Carnival, at that time, it was, it was amazing to me. You actually felt the country was talking about how they felt it was a safer place, a safer space, because the perception of crime is a reality for everybody, whatever is their perception of crime. And this is something we need to work on. We're constantly seeing it. The other night I sent out to the police service, listen, all of your vehicles need to be out at night, but make sure you put on the lights, because the lights in itself provide a deterrent factor to potential crime and criminality. So there is a lot of effort being put in at that level. HEMA crime, and especially type of crime that we're seeing in Trinidad and Tobago and across the world, is not only the hard element of fighting crime. Okay, so I am very concerned about the young people who are turning to the gangs and turning to the gangs for a sense of belonging. So the question becomes, what can we do? How can we intervene at a stage before they enter a life of criminality? And those are the areas where we're also spending some resources. So programs like MyLAT, CCC, these are very successful programs. When you go and you in interview the persons who are in the programs, who have come out of the programs, so the government has taken the decision to expand it. I've also recently told the heads of the divisions, the heads of the arms of national security, I want an intervention program into the schools. Let's send role model prisoners to talk to the young children about this is what one bad choice could mean to the rest of your life and how to avoid it. The police service will also be part of that, the defense force, programs at national security, cure violence, the national crime prevention plan. There are a lot of these types of plans. The, the homes being built, I'm working with Minister Webster Roy to ensure that we have uh, intervention homes for young men, young women. I'm looking at getting Presso Presso camp and, and Chatham camps back up as youth camps and, and sort of like booth camps because everyone isn't academically inclined. So these are some of the and interventions. And those are notable initiatives and those are initiatives direct to the youth. But what, but do, we do, the time, but what do we do in the meantime? But well, what do we do in the meantime? Already to the gangsters correct. that, that, that so what, are well, putting what on I'm society at risk. Because enough focus and emphasis isn't spent on those, those areas. To deal with crime, you have to tackle it from various sides, from left, right, all of the flanks. That is one, the education system. We need to spend time on our children to avoid them going. But in the meantime, we are going after the gangs. We are tackling the gangs very, very hard. The demonetization exercise, we haven't touched on that at all this morning. Did you gain any we are success? Now, we are now the most successful country and in the world and the only country in the world. And I'm very proud about that achievement because I was one of only three people who knew that that demonetization exercise was going to take place, and I was charged with the responsibility of getting it done from the security point of view. One of only three people in the whole country, Hema, we are now the case study for the whole world. Everybody said it couldn't be done successfully. No other country to got you. it done the way we did, and yes, it did work. Tell We've me how it worked. What was your litmus okay. test? Because you well, know, did you, you, what did you the affect the test? money flow for the gangsters? Because you still see the videos with thousands, well, hundreds going, of thousands. You're always going to see the videos. At the end of the day, one of the things you have to do is you have to tackle the money element in the life of crime, and that is happening. The demonetization exercise was a resounding success because we've gathered now a, a whole host of information that will now be analyzed for us to to do what needs to be done. Again, the police service, the FIU, I am hoping the BIR as well, 
get involved in that exercise. And yes, when the statistics come out, the central bank, is, the exercise is still going on. When the central bank completes it and provides these statistics, we are already seeing preliminarily that there was some cleaning up of money, meaning not money laundering, but that some of the money would have dropped out of the system. How much money people, dropped out of the system? As I say, it's still preliminary. Let the central bank provide those statistics at the appropriate time. They're still working it out. So that was one area of success. But also disruption, what people don't understand in crime, and this is one of the points I want to make this morning, success is also measured in what you're able to disrupt. And very often, you people won't know what you've been able to disrupt. So for example, you hear about a plot to assassinate somebody, you prevent that from happening. So the murder hasn't happened, but you don't hear about the success of that. So the same thing with the disruption of criminal empire, they, we are, they're, they're not gonna stop. So you have to constantly keep going at them, keep going at them. And that is what has happened with the demonetization exercise, which is a success. In that, there were a whole host, as I say, of information. Last week, we had a deputy secretary from the US Treasury come down, who is in charge of anti-money laundering in the United States. And he said to me, he said, we are extremely impressed. You are the country that is now ahead of everyone in successfully achieving a demonetization exercise. I want to return to the issue of crime. Have you said the prime minister seems to have a lot of confidence in you, Minister Young? Do you think that people have that level of confidence in you? At the end of the day, I could only do the best that I can, and I am assured that I am doing the, the best I can. Very often, consistently, when I'm in public, people come up to me and say, Mr. Young, you need to stay there, you need to keep doing what you're doing, we're supporting you, these types of things. The best part is when old ladies come up to you and say, look, I'm praying for you. And I keep telling them that is what keeps me going. Do you think at you're doing a good day, job, Minister Young? At the end of the day, a minister's job, and I'm people need to understand this is the minister must be the CEO. The minister, unfortunately, in my view, because I am a person who likes to get down on the ground, I like to roll up my sleeves and be part of the solution. A minister can't get involved in national security in the operation side and to drive it. So my job is to understand all of the various assets under national security to make sure they're properly resourced. And I think one of the things that I have successfully achieved is pulling all of the people around the table, pulling all of them around to share resources, to share information, to work towards the same goal. You've seen, I have seen the morale be lifted at the men. So the best people to ask the question about me is not to ask me, but ask the chief of defense staff, the commissioner of police, the director of the SSA, the head of prisons, ask the people in the prison service, the prison officers, what is it that they feel is and different about And what do you think the population Georgia, will say about you, Minister Young? Because in At their the mind, the, the day, murder rate and the level of crime and the fear is what they look to you for guidance correct. and support for. Do you think it's any better today? At the end of the day, I accept that the population needs to focus on somebody. I accept that the population will focus on the Minister of National Security. It is not an easy portfolio, but it is not one that I'm afraid of or I shirk away from. They will come to their own conclusions. I think the sensible people will know and will see but what I've brought to the office is integrity, I've brought morality, I'm certainly not engaging in anything untoward, and I'm giving my best effort. Whether they believe that is enough or it isn't enough, at the end of the day, the population will decide that. But I give them my assurance, regardless, I will continue to give my best, I am their humble servant, I will continue to bring all of my resources to bear on it, and to make sure that that energy and that push and that is why it is important for, as well for the population to understand that there's something amiss and something afoot, and that is why the police need to do their work. I want to return to that something amiss and something afoot because you had a number of murders occurring over the weekend. Do you think all of that is linked to a plot to destabilize the country? Are you telling me that all of the murders are linked no, to this I, plot? I never said that all of the murders are linked. What the police service need to do, so when they provide these statistics to me, and I sat down and I looked through the statistics, they need to come and disaggregate the statistics of murders in Trinidad and Tobago and show what it is. So over 70% of the murders are associated with gangs and gangs killing gang members and this type of thing. 70% of the murders, over 70% are associated with criminal gangs conducting murder, carrying out murder on one another. Okay. And when people begin to understand that, you begin to have a better understanding of crime. All right, so we talk about the 70%. Under Martin Joseph's tenure, there were 66 gangs. So from then till now, the gangs have simply flourished in spite of the slew of legislation that even your government has passed. Correct. So is it that no one was able to solve this problem? 
<laughs> no one has been able to solve in inverted commas depending on how you measure solving crime anywhere in the world. Every single country in the world is facing crime. But we can't concern ourselves with that. What is it that we're going to do and we're doing about the crime levels in Trinidad and Tobago? And I feel that we are putting a lot of effort behind it. Is it where it needs to be? In my view, no. I mean, obviously, I want to see the homicide rate come down. The police were telling me that 15%, the serious crimes of last year, 15%, they hit their target of reducing it by 15%. I said, okay, that's fine, but at the end of the day, the population is perceiving and fearing crime based on the murder rate, so we need to focus on that, and we are making the effort. Have you given yourself a time span? You have, well, elections are constitutionally due within the next nine to 12 months, let's see. Have you said by June or July of this year, I hope to see the figure 200, 300, are the days when Trinidad and Tobago was a sweet Caribbean island? Yeah, ma, I could say that every single second of my day, that I hope to see the homicide rate come down. I'm working towards bringing the homicide rate down, but there's no way that I could put a time on it, etc. because it's, it's just not in, that's not an area in control. As I said, when you have an incident such as took place on the 31st of December, where you're down, you're at a certain level, and someone can just go and cut conduct the most horrific of acts and, 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 and seek to murder a number of people, then how do you deal with that? So the answer is that we must continue working at it. We want to see it brought down. We are going to apply all of the necessary resources that we can in bringing it down. We're bringing in additional technology. We have been using new techniques. And I'm hoping that all of that coming together and the fact that the agencies are working a lot closer together, sharing together, and you're seeing that, that bond amongst them, that that will start to drive it down you know, I, in a downward rate. There was a st uh, statement, there was an editorial about Martin Joseph and his success, and obviously you are being compared now to your predecessors. Uh, at that time, under the then Manning administration and Basdeo Pandey being opposition leader, they understood that we need to put country first. Now people think that the crop of politicians simply let politics trump country and that there's no leadership, there's no clear direction and that we're not going to get the success that we did then. Okay, I don't understand what is the question, but if the question is that politicians should all work together towards one end. Well, why are you all unable to get the opposition? You say, oh, the opposition is not supporting. If Patrick Manning was able to do it, then why Keith Rowley cannot do it? It has absolutely nothing to do with Keith Rowley. You're dealing with a, uh, a group of politicians that have said, as I said, I said it at the outset of this interview, I, I saw it being circulated widely within the last few days, have said what their mandate as the opposition is. We will not support anything. We are going We are going to make this place ungovernable. Put that aside. Let's say that was just political rhetoric and talk. Then yes, let's come together. Let us have the discussions. But you see it with the legislation. Let's test it. The first piece of legislation that is now just about to go into the committee stage is the amendment to the, the, the Bail Act. To, put on a record that anyone found with an automatic firearm or a bomb or explosive device shouldn't have bail for 120 days. There is not a single sensible citizen in Trinidad and Tobago who would not agree with that piece of legislation. Let's use that as a starting point, come together and then drive that. The same way that the, if the opposition have information with respect to and their, their constituents, whoever the members of public, provide it to the police. If you can help us to fight crime, Let's do it. I am always prepared. As I said at the, in between this interview here, one of the things I'm going to be talking about in the next few days is I intend to have a big consultation and bring the stakeholders together for us to sit down and talk about the solutions to crime and what it is we can implement with the arms who are constitutionally charged with the responsibility Minister, to Minister, with all your respect, and I think it's a laudable initiative, but some may say it's too late that, let's well, say that... you can't throw up your arms and say it's too late. I can't change the past. People want to see action okay, now. Okay, and that is part of action. I'm not saying that is being done in isolation, everyone down stools. What needs to be understood, Hema, is there is action taking place, but I'm not one who's going to sit down and say, okay, well, this is going on and that is going on, so not, let's not try everything else that we can here. No, I keep telling them, it, you have to run parallel courses. You have to be doing things that are at the same time, and that is what is going on. The weight of the government's effectiveness on crime fighting is falling on your shoulders. 
Has, is, is it that the PNM, PNM governments are unable to battle crime? The highest murder rate was, second highest was last year, and the first time we recorded again well over 500 was under PNM government. Is the PNM government in its, in its structure unable to fight crime in this country? I don't think so. And, um, you know, I've thought long and hard about that. I've thought about why is it that you see these types of statistics. I have my own personal views that I'm trying to, to get the data to deal with. I'll just say this, as the Minister of National Security and as a person in the cabinet, I am not going to sit down with criminals and work out any deals with criminals as to how, how they should conduct their business and to appease them and to pacify them. I am certainly not going to do that. We are going to take the fight to crime, uh, the fight to the criminals as hard as we have been doing and increase that intensity and work more with the intelligence, which takes time to build out, and we're going to continue pushing it. Minister, so far we've seen rise of crime in the capital city and also in the borough of Arima. Both are jewels in terms of the constituency in the PNM crown. Is that a coincidence? Or is it that the PNM... I don't believe in coincidences. So then what's fueling I have crime said in that PNM what I've, been, what I've noticed is across the east-west corridor, I've noticed that certain divisions, and this is something we've been working on across the east-west corridor, have been seeing increases in homicide rates. That is something that the police are looking into and tackling. The collateral damage seems to be on the rise with these automatic weapons. What do you say, and you say that your government is doing, but what do you say to the people who are not gang members, who are standing on All Year's Day to buy a piece of pumpkin or p peas and rice for an All Year's Night dinner and caught in that crossfire? What do you say to the people who are traversing the streets of Port of Spain and have to flee or may get a stray bullet? What do you say to them? I say that guns don't kill people of their own volition someone has to be pulling the trigger i'm saying to the people of trinidad and tobago and in particular the people who are in the communities where these criminals are terrorizing get in touch with us let us know where we can find these people provide us with the information tell us where we can find it and we will do what needs to be done but we need that help as well we need the intelligence to know where to go where to look where to find these and we will pursue the criminals. Minister, I know we have about five minutes again, and there are three questions that I do want to get out. What specifically do you intend to do about the homicide rate? We are already seeing a spike in murders. There were four already recorded over the weekend. Triple murders have become seemingly a norm. You had a public outcry when two doctors were kidnapped, one died. You have all of the stories coming out. But the point is that people are crying in this country. What are you doing about the homicide rate? First of all, I want the people to know that I understand what it is they're going through because I feel it too. Every single time a law-abiding citizen is murdered or is the subject of any criminal act, I feel hurt, I feel angered. The commissioner of police, the chief of defense staff, or head of intelligence, prisons, etc., they constantly are sitting down, working out what are the initiatives that are in place, what new ones can be put in place, that is going to co continue. We are looking at the utilization of new technology that will help in the fight against crime. We are going to be bringing that in. There are a number of other initiatives which I can't get into the specifics because, of course, if you do that, you're alerting them as to the areas that you're coming, you're coming at them at, and I'm not going to do that. But I give the assurance that we will continue to work hard and harder and do what needs to be done to take on the fight with the criminal elements. Minister, we've heard about two main gangs that seem to be plaguing the capital city, the Rasta city and the Muslim gangs. Whether there is a gang or not, or what these gangs are, if you have this umbrella of legislation, why is it so difficult from the Martin Joseph days of 66 gangs to now, why is it so difficult to control these two gangs? <laughs> it's difficult, it's not about the controlling of the gangs, you know, it's about the reduction of the criminalities, the reduction of the membership of the gangs, it's how do you break the back. These are, at the end of the day, they're criminal enterprises. You have the Rasta city, you have the, the, the Muslims, those are the two fractions that quite a few of the criminals align themselves to, and it is something that is being tackled consistently. How is it being tackled? Well, again, I mean, I can't get into the specifics. One of the things we need to do, and you would have seen, this is where this slew of legislation comes into place. Explain your wealth orders, the type of anti-gang legislation, the pursuit of these criminal activities. You're seeing that a lot of persons are being picked up, persons are being charged consistently. The police on a daily basis, I mean, they, they, 
you get four or five media releases a day of who they've picked up, who's been charged, who's been found with ammunition. So you're seeing those inroads, but we need to get to, and this is why I'm also going to be doing some work with the international agencies to, to see what we could do on the supply side. You were not in government at the time. It was under the Manning administration where there was the now infamous 2008 accord with the Crown Plaza meeting. Was it effective as an, and is it, would you entertain something like that? Would I personally entertain it? No, I would not personally entertain it. I, I was very careful to say during the course of this interview, I have never sat down and had any discussions with any um, of these criminal gangs or any criminal gang membership, etc. And that is something that I personally will not do, no. I want to ask you also, Minister, before we wrap, there's the other issue where we look at crime, homicides, and the level of fear in our society. Domestic violence is also on the rise. I know that the police service has launched a unit. As Minister of National Security, what is it about our country that seems to have this level of violence, intimate partner violence? That is something that has concerned me throughout here, Mom. It is something, I mean, I've spoken on, at a number of, of events where they kick off trying to tackle it. There's something that bothers me. It's a pet bother of mine at the level of domestic violence. You say intimate partner, but there's also an element that people aren't aware about, that I became aware through reading and, and, and looking at what goes on in the reports, etc. Non-partner violence, so people who are not even in an intimate relationship. And to see the level of violence and, and against our women and children in the society bothers me tremendously. So I have told Minister Webster Roy, whatever you need me to do to assist in that area, I will. I'm happy that the police service are going the road that they do. But we need to provide some sort of plans and programs for the men in our society. This is my personal belief, because they are struggling in, in understanding and accepting and adapting to the changing roles between men and women in society. And maybe it is that they don't have the, the level of emotional intelligence and they're not as developed as they should be. But this is something that we need to tackle as a country, as a whole, as a society, because it is something that I don't want to see run away even further. Minister, as we wrap this interview, we've spoken about Vision 2020. Your government now talks about Vision 2030. In my vision, I would see a country where it's safe, we all prosper, and the quality of life is not being threatened or controlled. The Prime Minister has routinely said that he cannot go out and arrest people, and it's a small group of people. I would say if it's a small group of people, then this small group of people seem to be controlling this country. As Minister of National Security, you, people look to you for guidance, and they have put you in this position. In fact, the PNM was ushered on a promise that they will solve crime and that they will be, do better on corruption issues. Today, what do you want to say to the country? The murder rate, rate last year was the second highest ever recorded. The Prime Minister has reposed confidence in you. I asked you whether people will feel the same way. What do you want to say to them in 2020? I want to say to people, don't lose hope. Understand that we national security, the men and women in the police service, in your defense force, in your prison service, in immigration, even your lifeguards, your fire service, all of us, our intelligence services, are extremely concerned about crime in Trinidad and Tobago. And I want to assure the people of Trinidad and Tobago that everything is being done within the parameters of the law to take that fight to the criminal element and to push them back into the holes that they must reside in. And also that they, I hope to see successful charges and then successful prosecutions. We didn't speak about the criminal justice system, but that is another element in the whole crime fighting apparatus. That, that's where it, it hits a point and then it bottlenecks. And a lot of time and emphasis and effort has been played by this government in changing the legislation and providing resources there. These things don't happen overnight. There is absolutely no excuse being proffered. I remain the humble servant of the people and I will continue to do all in my power, all in my authority and all of my energy towards the fight against crime because I live here too and I am vested in Trinidad and Tobago. You asked me a question offset a short while ago, off camera. Why did I get involved in politics? I was naive. I got involved in politics because as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, I wanted to make a difference. Do you think you've made a difference? At the end of the day, that's for the people to decide. I know that I've come in here. I'm uncorrupted. There can be no allegation of corruption. I haven't done anything that, that would um, embarrass this country and the citizenry and I continue to serve and I will give the best that I have. I will bring all of my 
skills and efforts to bear on the fight against crime or anywhere else that I'm serving the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And what I want to ask the people is, work with us. Be part of the solution. It is very easy to sit on the outside, and I'm not saying that they're to sit on the outside and say this should be done. That is why I want to have this initiative. Come and let's sit down, let's talk about it. That's not going to stop all of the other initiatives we have going at the same time. Don't give up hope. We all need to build Trinidad and Tobago to be a better place. And you have my assurance that is what I will continue to do. What did you set as your yardstick? Everyone, when they come into office, will say, this is going to be my legacy, or this is my measure for success. What is yours coming into the Ministry of National Security? You know, th what you said is so true, and it is something that I never thought about. Because I said, I literally came into this, whether people believe it or not, to try and make Trinidad and Tobago a better place. Very quickly, I realized, even when I was in opposition, serving as a temporary opposition senator, that may be a little too naive. But if I can affect and turn 10 lives around in a positive manner, to me, that is an achievement. I have come in here, there is absolutely, I never think about, I have never made a decision, I could say this without fear of contradiction, this will be my legacy item. I don't think about that at all. I just think about getting the job done. It is not easy, it is not easy in the, the seat of national security, but I am prepared to do the work that needs to be, do, be done, and all I think about on a daily basis, and this is the truth, give the best that you can, put your head down, do your work, and just keep driving because you have a job to So you've not set yourself a target to say that 500 was unacceptable and let me bring it down to 300? 500 is unacceptable. 300 is unacceptable. When I read the past statistics, I, said, I think I read in the newspaper over the weekend that under George Chambers it was 50. Yes. I would love to get us back down to those levels, but I am also realistic as to what is in my control. I would love the ability to be one what of those police of officers. Control? Well, what is out of my control is I can't do the investigations. I can't do the prosecutions. I can just sit, I can drive policy, I can give suggestions and this type of thing. I have told the policemen time and time again, I wish I could and I am prepared to wake up at three o'clock in the morning and to go on the raid, to do what needs to be done to, to provide that level of support. And that is what we as a society need to do. I think if everybody just does their own little bit in their own little space, then we are going to be heading in the right direction. Minister, I do thank you for taking the time this morning. I know this is our first interview and the first interview that you've done on live television. Uh, Minister of National Security, Stuart Young, there were a number of issues that we discussed this morning from the post-cabinet news briefing to a state of emergency to what is being done to other measures outside the law enforcement in terms of social interventions. Whether or not they will make a difference, well, time will tell. And I guess, as is customary, the country will judge any government's performance when the election bell is rung. Thank you again, Minister. We take a short break. When we come back, we'll have more for you.